Greetings and welcome everyone. My name is Diane Diaz de Fazio and on behalf of Eve Khan and the Grow Your Club Committee on Special Functions, I am delighted to introduce today's event, which is co-sponsored by the American Antiquarian Society and the Grow Your Club. Um, so welcome everyone. Fair warning, yep. you may be muted, uh, but I will get more to our housekeeping in a moment. Um, today we present Surprises from the Stacks, Hello 2024, New Year's ephemera from the American Antiquarian Society. This online behind the scenes tour of the AAS highlights the importance of New Year's celebrations in American culture and is led by Lauren B. Hughes. Lauren is Vice President for Collections and Andrew W. Mellon Curator of Graphic Arts at AAS. She builds and cares for the society's collection of prints, broadsides, ephemera and photographs and works with the curatorial team, the Center for Historic American Visual Culture or CHAVIC, the AAS fellows and outside scholars to make connections between American history and the visual resources of the society. She has published widely on American printmaking and portraiture. Now that promised housekeeping. Lauren is going to present the AAS treasures for about well, the bulk of our time together. And then we will have time at the end for Q&A. The chat is open. So as they come to you, feel free to type in your questions throughout the event. I will serve as moderator and field them to Lauren at the end. Of course, we trust that everyone will remain muted throughout Lauren's presentation, but Eve, Eve is on hand as our monitor and I and she will keep an eye on things so there are no audio interruptions. And with that, I'll turn it over to Lauren. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Eve. Welcome to AAS, at least virtually. And also, Happy New Year. That's what we're going to be talking about today. And I thought we better start with a welcome to 2024, because uh, we're going to go back in time to 1754, and then we're going to come forward again. So as, as Diane noted, I am the Curator of Graphic Arts here. I also have a role as the Vice President for Collections. What is the American Antiquarian Society? Um, as I'm looking at this screen, those of you who have your cameras on are quite literally surrounded by books. So I'm guessing that most of you know who we are. We are a national research library. We are located in Worcester, Massachusetts. We are open to the public uh, five days a week, uh, free, Come on up, come and see our material. We'd love to have you. There are lots of programs that the society does. You can see a lot of them on our website. We'll put some links in the chat as I'm talking about other resources that you could find if you're looking for, well, what does that place have? Do they have book plates? Oh, yes, we do. So we'll make sure that we have some good information sharing happening there. So the Antiquarian Society has been around a while. We were founded in 1812. The goal of the collection is to preserve the printed history of the young nation in 1812, and that has expanded somewhat. Our holdings cover the United, what becomes the United States, Canada, the Caribbean, through 1876 with many collections going up to 1900, and you're going to see some of those today. You're, we're not going to, we don't have any date restrictions here uh, other than pre-1900. There are 25 miles of stacks in the building that is behind me. I'm coming to you from our smart classroom, which was very fortunately built in 2018, 2019, right before the global pandemic. So we were able to jump into this virtual world. Uh, the 25 miles of stacks that are in, in the building here in Worcester hold about four and a half million objects. So it's a sizable collection which is really available digitally and through cataloging on our website. All of that aside, the whole point of this today is to share stuff with you on our document camera. So I'm gonna actually have our tech help here, turn on the document camera. So you'll see that appear in a second as your main screen. And we're gonna talk about some ephemera. So starting with the New Year's holiday, in the 18th century, the practice of celebrating New Year's came to the United States through European settlements. So they brought the people, were, you know, people have been shooting off loud things on New Year's since the beginning of time. 
Um, all different cultures celebrate the holiday differently. The year breaks for different cultures on different days. We're going to be talking about predominantly the January 1st holiday, the, the, the December 31st, January 1st holiday, um, which is primarily a European calendar. So that's, that's the New Year's that I'm talking about. Someday we should do a program on solstice. That's a whole different animal. Uh, when the broadsheet that you can see part of here on the screen was sent out in 1754, it was intended as a gift. This was printed by a printer in Boston. Let me just move it up a little bit. Hopefully not making people dizzy. So you can see how far down that goes. There's the bottom. Uh, it has lots of little short, um, quite moralistic stories about good behavior in children. So this sheet was intended to be sold and then taken to the home and read to children so that they could have good behavior for the upcoming year. Nothing like telling your kids what to do. There we go. So that's one of the earliest pieces of New Year's ephemera in our collection. And I guess I should stop a minute and explain what I mean by ephemera. There's whole society related to the collection of ephemera. I'm sure some of you are members. Um, ephemera here at AAS is defined as something that was not intended to be saved. It was something that was a consumable, that was to be used, often tossed away or repurposed. A lot of paper gets reused, the uh, back gets written on, et cetera. The ephemera collection here at the Society includes broadsides, trade cards, uh, billheads, valentines, menus, book plates, uh, and we'll put a link in the chat that will give you a, a pathway to go to our website that has all the ephemera collections described. So that's something that, that we will put in the chat as the day goes on here, as the event goes on. Um, so this is one of the earliest pieces. It's something that would have been you know, used, consumed, and I don't know if ours has anything on the back. Let me look. Nope. Ours was folded down into a little tiny pocket, but does not have anything on the back. This other card that's on the screen is for me to sort of give you the brackets of what we're going to talk about today. We're going to briefly spend a little bit of time in the 18th century, and I mean really briefly, because we're mostly going to focus on the ephemera in the 19th century and how it was made and distributed. But this is the beginning. And in fact, actually, let that one go away, and we'll bring up this one. In 1790, this little sheet was printed, and this sheet reflects a whole world of print culture that exists around New Year's. And this is what, I like to think of these as um, shilling for tips, basically. People who were doing service in the community, this is for the news carrier, the newsboy, uh, when you had your paper delivered. Uh, every New Year's, they would print up a little poem and they would bring it to your house and ask you to pay for that home and basically give them their tip for the year so that they had, uh, since they had given you such good service. So this is, uh, they're usually signed by the printer's devil, which are the younger um, members of the print shop who would be doing that delivery. This one is great because it does include a little tiny image of the newsboy up at the top here, handing his little poem to his customer inside the door. This is from 1789 and was published in New York. But it's not just newsboys. Oh no. Once we get this idea of getting money for tips, lots of people in the professions and community service professions, oops, sorry about that, that was me, start working the system a bit. So we have the lamplighter's address. This is a Boston broadside that this little poem would have been handed out for tips. That was a bit later, this is 1827. The watchmaker, the, the watchman's address over here is 1828. I like this one because he's basically giving you a little bit of a threat. You know, give me my tip here because I want to make sure your house doesn't burn down, uh, please. Great cut there as well. The, the poems are uh, atrocious. I mean, they're really bad poetry, but they're, um, they're charming in that you can see where the worker is trying to explain how good they've done, how what good work they've done this year and why they're important and they should sleep, receive a tip. So this stuff is circulating on New Year's Day or right usually the day before or the day after so that tips can be procured. But there's also lots going on on New Year's 
in the 19th century. So I'm going to move into the 19th century now. And we're going to, I've got, I know Henry is on here. So I have a couple of menus. These are two menus from the collection. I'll flip them over in just a second. Let me see. So you can see them. Okay. Uh, we have a 1865 Civil War menu here. And then this is an 1886, much later menu. Um, the holiday, New Year's Day, was celebrated widely in the US, um, actually more than Christmas. Um, it's almost like a, a community social holiday. It wasn't just your family. Christmas was a family holiday. And New Year's was, um, you know, your, your business professionals and people that you had worked with or uh, socialized with. You could get together and have a dance or a dinner in this case. So there's a lot of oyster stew and boiled ham happening over here for the soldiers. I don't know what you all ate for New Year's dinner, but um, oyster stew maybe, yeah. Boiled ham, no, I had enough of that at Christmas. Um, I'd like to have something else, thank you. This menu, the 1880s menu, is a game menu. Um, get that out so we can zoom in so you can see it. Thank you, Nick. So this is some duck, uh, also oysters, because, you know, why not? Roast turkey, roast raccoon, roast rabbit, uh, venison, quail, boil, broiled partridge. I almost said boiled, that would have been pretty terrible. But then a full dessert menu at the bottom as well. This is a major, a major feast. Um, and there would be usually like a program, a lecture, or something like what we're doing. You know, we're, we're talking, or somebody's going to learn something, we're going to talk about things, um, and, or dance, which is the other, the other piece that you can have there. So, hmm. dances were very common. There we go. How's that? Can you see those? Yes. Um, we have a lot of tickets for uh, uh, tickets and um, invitations to dances on the 31st and the 1st. Again, you know, you've had your Christmas time with your family and there, there'll be some links in the chat to um, some manuscripts in our collection, which are about making New Year's resolutions. Uh, so they've, they've tracked people writing in their diary what they're, what they're resolving to be like a better person and, you know, uh, make more money or whatever their resolution is. Very much like what we do today. Uh, that was happening in the 19th century. They were also really kind of um, looking at social uh, behaviors. So there's dances, a lot of dances, a lot of opportunity for young people to meet each other um, in a structured environment. So this is, you know, um, young ladies who are uh, unmarried and young men who are unmarried in a supervised dance that's organized by something like the engine company which is what this, this one is a fireman's ball for New Year's. So New Year's was, I mean, it was always a party, a, a concept of a party is always gonna happen on New Year's. Um, and eventually this, this kind of ephemera continues. The tipping that we saw earlier, that fades out. And what happens in the middle part of the century is we start to get greeting cards. So this is 1879, this one. And so this is a crew theme little card. This is something actually that you would hand out. You wouldn't mail this one. And we're gonna move into cards in a second, but I wanna get one more format. So this is, this, is the, this is where cards are gonna start. This is the other thing that comes out as a freebie. And we have loads of these too. Uh, calendars. I actually still get a calendar from my insurance company, the people who have insurance on my house. I always get a calendar every year at New Year's and I think, what am I gonna do with this? It's got their ad on it, <laughs> you know? Right, right, it's it's ephemera, I'm gonna keep it. I actually do have one in the box, which is a, a sad, tells you something about me. Um, but I love these print, the, the uh, calendars by printers. They're so great because they're showing off, you know, they show their, their skills at lettering, they have their address, they talk, sometimes they talk about what they print. And then these are meant to be pinned up. This one has actually a hole in it up here where it would be pinned up in an office and they would give these out to their clients. So colored ephemera, colored, beautiful wax, paper, uh, paper book. So those are some of the formats that exist. And what happens is, so most of the things that you've seen so far have been letterpress. Um, there's, been a couple, there's been a couple of one engraved item and the two lithographed uh, calendars. And what happens after the war is chromolithography 
takes off. So what is that? What is chromolithography? So chromolithography is color printing using lithographic methods. It is very quickly um, adapted by most printers to create affordable color imagery. It's, it, even though it seems like it takes a lot of technology to do, and we'll talk about that in a second, it is actually cheaper than doing an engraving or setting up some uh, letterpress type. So and you get color, which is the bonus. This is a card that was produced um, in Boston by the Louis Prime Company. Um, I love the fringe, I don't know. Some people get freaked out by the fringe, I love the fringe. Uh, that would have been sent on New Year's to, um, there's, your, there's your greeting on the back, uh, to a, a friend or a family member. And then this would be displayed in your cabinet in your house. So you could set it up so it would look like you would set it up like on a little stand something like this, so you could display your cards. Um, and then people saved these in albums and scrapbooks. Or they didn't, they threw them away. So we're gonna talk about that in a minute. So chromolithography, what is that? How does that work? Sorry, loud noise, loud noise. Okay, loud noise done. How does it work? What is chromolithography? So the great thing about AAS is that the depth of the collection means that we can not only show you great stuff, but we can show you how it's made and what else is being sold at the same time. So this is a progressive truth book, looks like that. It's a big bound book. This was a book that was produced by the Louis Prang Company, which was a major chromolithography firm located in Boston, and they had a factory in Roxbury. They produced this print, this one here, of Whittier's Barefoot Boy uh, as a lithograph. As this is it, that's what it looks like, that's the whole print, it's finished. This book is the progressive proof book that the company created to help them remember how the print was made. Because in this period, chromolithography is done stone by stone. Each color that you see is a stone. This weird looking line drawing is the keystone. This is how you're gonna make sure all your stones line up and you get proper registration. I know there are some printers on here. I'm sorry for this. This is just gonna be a little bit of basics. We're gonna go back to basics. Um, so this progressive proof book is the history of how that print was actually made so that when they sold out the run, they could go get this book out of their library pull the stones out of the stone library. They'd already know what inks needed to go and what order the stones needed to go in so they could print it again. That's why they keep the progressive proof book. What is that you say? What is a progressive proof book? Progressive proof book is each, on this side of the page is each individual stone printed. And on this side of the page is all the stones so far together. So this is actually, we're missing page one in this. So this is actually stone number two here. And this is one and two together. Now, hold on, because it's gonna get more interesting. This is stone number three, the blue one. And then this is one, two, and three together. The creepy baby, he looks a little creepy there, but hang on, he'll look better in a minute. Four, I'm gonna add the green. How about that green? That is an amazing green. Adds it over here, tones it right down. Now we're gonna warm it up with some red. More here. Each one of these, remember this is a stone, and then this is the compiled stone. So the way they would do this is they would print the, the, the image, original painting that was done of the little boy with his hands in his pocket would have been brought to Louis Prang, or Prang would have purchased it. That would have been taken to um, a person called a chromiste, whose job it was at Prang and Co. to take that picture, put it in front of him, and in his mind, take it apart by color, and then figure out what order these plates and stones had to be, first of all, what colors they needed, and then what order they had to be done in. Each one would be done, and then the paper would have to dry. Eventually they invent dryers, and they're able to dry it much quicker, but initially they had to dry them, wait, wait for them to dry. And then it would be run again. So I think we're up to six, I'm getting some more black here. You can see him starting to come away from the background a little bit. Seven, there are 22 stones in this print. So you can kind of get a sense, woe be the soul who messes up 
stone number 16 because all of the prints are up to you know what one to 16 and if something has gone wrong the whole run has got to be redone uh, so what i like about some of these stones is they're really quite focused this is to like warm up the skin tone of the young boy then he decides to cool it down again. So every time this is printed, this is giving the chromiste information about what do I need to do next? Am I right? Oh, oops, I need more red. I didn't give enough red on my little person's face and hands. And then he's gonna add more detail with a black tint stone. Now you can start to see the background coming together. More gray, go back and forth warm, very common in these books. They go back and forth, warm, cold, warm, cold, trying to build the color that they're waiting for. And you can see his face is still really kind of, okay, creepy, but it, you know he's gonna get some structure in there in a minute. Here it comes. I love that one. There's like, all he wanted is a wash to tone the sky down. <laughs> And it gives a little bit to the to the white shirt to brighten it up a little bit. So as you're looking at anything that's chromolithographed, so anything, uh, how common are the chromolithographs? Oh, so we have um, we have about forty seven of them, and the Boston Athenaeum has another really nice stash of the Prang firm because the Prang firm. Um, uh, Louis Prang decided to get out of the printing business and get into the art supply business. And so he closed the firm and there was a huge auction in the twenties. I think this one we got in, this one is a new, new acquisition, but the rest of them came in 1925, 1926. And we had a member in Boston who uh, bid for us at that auction. So that is how uh, we got these. I think I've probably seen maybe four or five that we've added. We've added all Prang because we're building that, that collection, but other lithographers in other cities would have had these pro progressive proof books as well. In their time, they were extremely common, particularly for like images that sold really well. So presidential portraits, this one, Whittier's Barefoot Boy was a really popular Prang print. And that, that's why the lithographer would, the company would want to keep them. Uh, and yes, the Louis Prang Company is the one that still makes the pencils, correct. Uh, and when I was growing up, the little um, white palettes of watercolors that they used to give you in school were Louis Prang and Co. too. Um, the company has been sold multiple times, however, it is no longer uh, the family owned firm that it was. So uh, let me get, so again, back to the, the, book, the book, you can see some of the stone, some of the prints were really very, very minor adjustments that were made. In this case, they're giving a bit more red cheek to the little boy, and other ones would be more complete. So anything that's chromolithographed has gone through this process. It might be six stones, it might be 21 stones, it might be 41 stones, uh, anything. So when the prints are being, the printed material is being made, there is, as you might have already figured out, significant labor involved, significant labor. So the chromiste, once he's done his job, he's done. This book goes to the pressmen, and the pressmen have to then, okay, the head, the head foreman has to say, I need this stone, I need this stone, I need to work with the paper, I need to make sure everybody's got everything done. And the reason that chromolithography was so successful is that labor in the United States after the Civil War was inexpensive. There was a lot of immigration happening in the U.S. at this period. So there were a lot of people coming over from places like Germany, where chromolithography had been well established, who had technical skills and could do the work. Um, so tons of labor, millions of times through the press, and then Louis Prang is going to sell this to you for like two dollars, right? So it's it's a it's kind of an expensive thing, but it's not a hugely expensive thing. Some of the material that we're going to see are things that are selling for five cents, two cents, eight cents, and so you start to wonder like all the labor that went into the greeting card that you sent to your aunt Maud, you know, it might be a, a thirteen stone greeting card. Aunt Maud is going to read that and then toss it in the bin, right? Or recycle it. So coming to appreciate the technology behind this material is one of the things that I have been talking about for, I don't know, what, 17 years? <laughs> um, it is a, a really amazing process that when I brought these proof books out for a graphic design class from a local community college here, the students were absolutely aghast. There's no way that anyone could do that with their brain. That's what Adobe Photoshop is for. 
So it was a great lesson um, to kind of say, you know what? Nope, humans are amazing and we can do amazing things. So at the end of this, right, we're gonna get to the end, I promise. We'll get through all 20 whatever stones. <laughs> and the last one, it's colder and colder, is where you get, somewhere in here, we get the Louis Prime credit line, which is right here, put on the stone. Some of these proof books have more information than this one. This one's been trimmed down. Often the color bars will be down on the side that will have each ink square, so you know which ink square, which color you're supposed to use. But this one, I think maybe it got used so frequently. Oh, all right. So that is how chromolithography is made. So let's look at some chromal parts. How am I doing on time? Okay, good. I can actually talk about that book for like an hour, so that's why I'm gonna make sure I don't do that. So sending greeting cards was something that really happened um, in this time period, Prime was one of the first to adopt it. He's really famous as the, you know, the beginner of the American Christmas card. But New Year's cards are right up there. And in fact, in our collection, I think we probably have equal amounts of New Year's cards to uh, Christmas cards and birthday cards, both. Sending cards, uh, I mean, we still do it today, but I think less. A lot of people do e-cards now. So sending cards when you could get these chromolithographed cards like this was a, a pleasure. People love to get them in the mail. They would save them. We have loads of scrapbooks with people's Valentines and their New Year's cards pasted in. These are two cards that were printed in London uh, because I didn't want to leave this group thinking, oh, it's only American stuff. In fact, uh, in the United States, the German print printers, the French printers and the European printers very quickly flooded our markets with unbelievably beautiful cards. Um, you know, just, they have to just really show off how great they are. Um, and Louis Prime was determined to kind of grab that market share back. So these cards are printed by chromography. In England, it's not unusual to see cards in American scrapbooks that uh, are from foreign places. So it's not, it's not, you know, they're circulating. You could go into the card store, basically, just like you do today. You have to pick the card for the person, right? So you have to say, Oh, that Aunt Maud, she loves cats. This would be great for her. I'm gonna send her this one. This is a, a little um, card that you would hand out to like your friends at school that would go into like a little book. That's a, that's a Louis Fran. These are all three Louis Fran cards. And then this one is the fringe cards with the message on the back that you would put out for display. All right. What about that fringe? What the heck is that fringe about? Um, I'd love to take a poll. We too bad we didn't do a poll. We can see a fringe. Are people, are people freaked out by fringe? We <laughs> love it. Um, so this is a, an example of a series of cards. This, this printer is unidentified, but you, essentially the same kind of model card with different text in the box. And then all they do is add a backing card and they sandwich the fringe in between. So this one's blank. And then the furry fringe makes it nice. It's pretty. I think. It does, of course, catch dust like that one right there. A little schmutz in there. Observation. Okay, and then we're gonna go to this one. Actually, I'm gonna hold on that one. No, no, we'll do this one. This is uh, J. Lowell and Co. This is another big Boston firm. And this is where cards are starting to look more like what we're used to, right? So it opens on the short side. And then this is where you put the message inside here. So he's basically the December, it's December 25th to January 1st, 1880, 1881. For the wishes for the good year in the back. Um, and I want to show this because the last thing I want to show here so that we have time for questions is um, a ginormous volume from the Prime Company archive. Okay, let's see if this works. Give me a minute. Okay, I'm going to try and keep my head out of the shot now. Nobody needs to see my gray hair. Um, this is also from that same, those same auctions where the society was able to acquire the progressive proof books. We also got, um, hmm, maybe three or four dozen salesman sample books. So this is a Louis Prang, this is from the Boston office, uh, Christmas and New Year card sample book. This thing got used. I mean, it is, um, you can see it has had a life. Things are, um, you know, barely holding on and together. 
But this would be a traveling salesman's book that would have gone out. Hang on, that big head has to come in for a minute. With a salesman to stationer shops, to any kind of paper goods store where they could sell or get an order. So there's annotation at the top corner of each set of the cards of what the wholesale price is for the sets. What's great about these is if you collect this stuff, these volumes show you what the whole set was, which is a really great resource for people who are um, uh, set maniacs like myself. I wanna make sure that I have the entire set so that I can present that to a researcher complete. And so you can see, like this is their very modest. This is, these six are gonna sell wholesale for 20 cents. And then these five, four are 25 cents because they have a little bit a little bit more work in them. All right, so we're gonna flip through this a little bit for ooing and eyeing factors. Let me make sure it's in the shot. Be still my heart. Yes, that's how I feel about them. Um, what I like about Prang is he is trying to hit any possible customer, right? So if somebody's really interested in um, uh, more, more Japanese styling, he's got, I got that for you. I can do that for you, right? These are all 12 for 40 cents wholesale. So the, the um, yeah, they are very similar. Uh, Len, they are very similar to the scrapbooks in which people would like later paste what they received. The key piece here is this up here because it's the, it's the annotation and some salesmen would actually write in order numbers at the bottom in some of the volumes. This one does not have that. Oh, here's Aunt Maud's cat. Uh, so again, this is where you would have the whole set. And then there's one of the frogs for sort of humor printing. But let's remember how many stones are these, right? This, this set would have been set up on a stone, definitely, like all four on one stone so that they would be, and then they'd be cut and printed. But you know, this could be maybe, I'm not a promise, maybe 11 stones to get through these little cards. Think about how many he has to actually print to make 60 cents wholesale. I mean, this is, he's printing a lot. And we have ones that are based on the seasons. These are both, uh, language of flowers is really big at New Year's. So you're sending out hopeful signs. Yeah, these scrapbooks have this problem also that, you know, when they were acquired by us, either this card is discontinued and the salesman took it out, it's fallen out, or at some point over its life, somebody decided it was too nice and they want to keep it. That one we don't have. And you'll see that throughout too. And then there's annotations on this side where they're making notes about numbers of what things are gonna cost. With fringe, without fringe, right? You can have it with fringe. Um, having fringe adds, you get 12 of them with fringe for $3. Up here, you get 12 of them, no fringe for $1.20. So fringe is premium, shows that you spent more money, right? Love these with the vases. Uh, often on this side, you'll have the backing and here sometimes the salesman would opt, you would have options. So you could have the oranges on the back or you could have something else on the back. So you could make that order. I totally agree with you, Brianna. Everyone needs a fringe card in their lives. That's another one that opens. I don't know, it's a, it's a, you know, I kind of getting ready for this. I got ready for this before New Year's because I wanted to make sure I had everything ready. And I'm like, man, I kind of wish we did this still. We still, we could sell these cards. These are beautiful cards. I would love to get this in the mail. More fringe. Again, the front and the back, and then the inside fold out. The other great thing about these albums is how fresh and bright the color is because they have been in the dark for the majority of their lives. So getting, you notice they're getting bigger. We're up to $9 for a set of 12 now. Almost to the end. Um, this is just to show you that the calendar also can creep into the card business. So you can have, this could be sent as a card. So you would give somebody the, the new year and the old year in the card with fringe, without fringe, et cetera, could be mailed as a card. So just to tie the calendars back in. Some of the big giant ones that we've seen already. Like 
that. One more page, I think. Okay. So we're going to end here with this volume. Uh, let's see. So you can see something for everyone. A little bit of oceans. We got cats. We have frogs. We have beautiful flowers. Just shut this. And then on top of it, I'm just going to show this last set. Uh, and I wanted to end with, okay, good, I'm leaving enough time for talking. Um, postcards, because, let me get my head out. Um, the postcard starts as a chromolithographed thing. These are all about 18, eight, uh, sorry, 1908, 1910. Um, uh, somebody wants cards with the AS logo. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Um, there are they in. So postcards really first of it initially start as chromolithograph objects and they become, they make that transition to photomechanical. So photomechanical, which is kind of the basis of four color, which is what we all consume today, uh, is what's gonna end chromolithography. And in some ways I think Louis Prang probably got out of the business at the right time and went into art supplies, art supply business because he knew the end of chromolithography was coming as four color was kind of replacing um, the quality, he didn't love the quality of four color. So postcards start, and these are all postcards that were sent to the um, two little girls who lived here in Worcester. And they almost always have messages on the back about happy new year, um, you know, be good, uh, wishing you the best, that kind of thing. And that's how I wanna end this because it's sort of to show where, how far we've come since 1754, where we're telling children to behave themselves or not. And we end up with, cards that are being sent by their cousins and their aunts to two little girls in Worcester for them to collect. So that is the last part of the behind the scenes tour. Um, and I'm going to ask if there are more questions and oh, there's a lot, there's a big number on the chat. So let me go to Diane. I tried to catch them as I saw them, Diane. You did, are there you're other, a hero. Are there other questions? Um. Well, I had a question, and then there's also at least one from Eve, and we'll let others kind of percolate on up. Um, Eve, do you want to read your own question? Yeah, I'm just wondering, um, Lauren, that was so fantastically kaleidoscopically brilliant that you were answering the questions while the stream of consciousness about traditions and family and collecting and printing. Sorry, I, I don't mean to fangirl. I'm going to try to not to fangirl too much. When you dug into the collection for this presentation, did anything strike you that you hadn't noticed before? Some recurring motif for food or or immigrant tradition? Did anything surface just looking through the full kaleidoscope of this? The nicest, the best part about getting ready for this was actually going through the salesman books. Uh, we have so many of these and I needed to pick one that had a lot of good New Year's stuff in it, right? To make sure that it had a section of New Year's. So the the going through those albums, I have not looked at all of them. Many of them are digitized. I think like the first maybe 20 or so have been digitized. We still have a long way to go on those. Um, so I don't, you know, you don't see them easily. You have to pull them out. They're heavy, they're bulky, they're fragile. Um, and looking through there and just seeing how much, uh, how many options you had, I feel sort of bad for the people who worked in the, the stationary stores who had to pick, you know, like, oh, well, I know my customers, they like frogs. I'm going to take the frog set. Um, you know, it's, it's almost um, too much. It's like sometimes how I feel when I go down the cereal aisle at the grocery store and I think, you gotta be kidding me. How much cereal can a person eat? There's like 60 different choices of cereal. And that's kind of what the Louis Prang going through those as I was getting ready for the program made me think of like, wow, you could, you could do anything. You could do any option for a card and then they would sell. Thank you, good question. Absolutely. They're just they're, the colors, as you said, they've been they've been in the dark for so long. The colors, the colors, the colors are amazing. Um, so my initial question came about as um, you were showing the first few items, Lauren. Yeah. And it's kind of a much broader question that hopefully collectors and collecting minded folks on this call um, will also be thinking about, but can you tell us a little bit more about how AAS stores all of these amazing things? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, I can actually. Can you hand me one of those? Oh, mm -hmm. So okay. the um, the Prang volume, the big the big beast here, uh, has its own box. 
uh, lives in a, a, a custom size. Big boxes are stored flat like this. We do limit some use on these. They have to be in these ginormous cradles out in the reading room because we really worry about the binds on them. Uh, again, the books are, these, the salesman books are tapped properly. Like the binding is meant to be open flat so that you could sell the cards inside. So there's not a lot of stress on the binding like you would worry about maybe with an 18th century, really fine, tightly, tightly sewn binding. So the, at least the, the books are actually built for it, but they have been um, so heavily handled in their lifetime that we do you know, try to limit that, that those come out when people really need to see them. Um, the greeting cards, not, oh, did you, can you put me back on the, on the screen? I'm sorry. Over there. Um, all of our cards are stored like this. Mm -hmm. so, pardon the mylar, okay? It's gonna, it's gonna glare to you. But everything is in a liner. Oh, man, you didn't put it back in the liner. <laughs> <laughs> It goes to the liner like that, a little pocket, and then that goes in to its outer cover, like that. And then those are stored on end like that, sorted by printer, because everything here, well, sorted by holiday and then by printer. So everything in, in AAS, the printer is the priority. So in our cataloging, right, so all the prangs are together, all the Mark Swords are together, uh, all the Lowell's are together. So we can show that to people who are doing research on printing. This kind of material in the, the big flats that I started with, the 18th and early 19th century material, these are all stored in uh, acid-free folders, in drawers, kind of like print room storage, right? Except that the folders are a bit thinner because we have loads of these products. So they're in a folder like that. And it closes, and then they're stacked and they're organized by their date. So that all the 19, 1827 are together. All the 1828 are together. Yeah, there's the box. Let me show you the box. This is the custom box. That's for the prime volumes. Again, these are you know pretty standard boxes. And we put the label on. This one has been scanned, which is great. And these are our record IDs, so we can find them in our computer system. Um, pretty standard stuff. Look at see, look at that. You can see how much that the binding is just going dirt, 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 dirt. Not embarrassed to show the dirt. So does that answer your question about it storage? Did. It did. Thank you for indulging my storage nerd. <laughs> well, and the other great thing about the society is that everything is here, so it's stored on site. So it only takes us about fifteen minutes to page something for a reader out front. You know, it's right here. We don't have to get it from off-site storage or anything like that. It's a big plus for us. So we're constantly assessing our storage growth needs. You know, like, okay, how many how many years of shelving do we have left, and how many years of drawers? So, all right, I've lost the chat again because I put the camera back up, sorry. It's all right, um, let's Hi, go ahead. Oh, oh. Hey, Henry. Henry, Hi. go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, thank you so much, Lawrence. Very interesting presentation, and, and thank you for sharing that. I, I, I haven't seen one of those lithographer's books before, which is amazing, and um, I was struck. I'm not the first person that's noticed this, I'm sure, but I, I'm asking you if I'm... I'm struck by the, the process of, of um, this, the process by which the stones hit, hit the uh, art is yeah. almost is mimicking what a watercolorist would do if they were doing that scene because yeah. they, they do colors like that and they layer on like that. And, and as you went through those, those pages, I'm saying they've mimicked watercolor. Yeah. And watercolorist. Right, and uh, many of the chromists who have the special skill brain to be able to take a finished work and take it down apart are artists, are creative artists who would do watercolor oil themselves. So they would understand kind of the building up that uh, a painter is doing um, to break that, to be able to break it back down. But the, the key thing that the chromist has to also understand is the printing process so that they understand how inks are going to layer properly, how they're gonna, you know, how sheer do they have to be, what kind of what kind of um, 
of dark light, dark light do I have to do to, in order to get that sort of three dimensional quality that they're going for? You know, you're painting with ink, which is crazy and, and ink and, and labor on a, on a press. There is, of course, in every lithography shop, there is a proofing press. So they aren't running, you know, they aren't taking the, the stones and running 6,000 prints to test it first. They're gonna do proofs first so that they aren't wasting paper. So the Chromis has time. Uh, the, the, the proof books, the progressive proof books are the finished solution. Like that's what they use. But you know, there are mistakes, <laughs> right? Where he might've gone too orange or too blue. And so then there's a correction that's made that never ends up in the progressive proof book because they don't want to repeat it. They're so cool. I love those things. I love to teach with them. I'm glad that, that you enjoyed that. That's a, a favorite part of the collection for me. Thank you. There, the chromolithography is always a big hit, as you know, Lauren. Um, so there are several questions pertaining to chromolithography and the books. Uh, we're even to start. <laughs> there were... Combine them. Combine them. Let's see if I okay, can. Okay. So we've got chromolithography also echoes stenciling color onto early prints. Yep. Are there any chromolithography firms today? And yes. then uh, also, how do you know? This is my question. Um, I know that Crystal Bridges in Arkansas has praying books. This is our yep. mutual friend Jason Dean wrote yep. about them years ago. Um, and there's also the praying collection in Maryland. Yeah, and there's Maryland has some, and the um, the Hallmark um, the com the Hallmark Card Company archive has some. So I know someday I've got to go out there and see what they've got because they have other printers too. So their founders were buying stuff. We were really lucky that. Prang, that auction happened in Boston and our we had a member who was Johnny on the spot and was down there bidding for us. Um, because I don't think, like I've said, I've added less than a dozen of these and um, Gigi's added maybe one or two as well. We don't, they don't come up very often. Yeah. And they're, you know, they're very quirky things. I mean, they're not necessarily something that a collector would maybe want. I, I love them because I'm interested in the printing process, but it isn't, it's not finished, you know, it's all about how something is made. And yes, there are lithography firms. Um, there was a kind of a revival of lithography in the, uh, the 1950s and 60s. So a lot of contemporary artists helped to restart lithography. Uh, what they like, what, what creative artists like, modern artists like about lithography is it's very uh, immediate. So the artist can work with a press team to really put like, color onto the stone they can you know they can be in, engaged with the stone so you'll see like Robert Rauschenberg. i mean there's lots of people who are printing in, in from lithography there's um, a lot of lithography company uh, firms that only print for creative artists so that's another uh, aspect there's like like tandem press for years was doing that um uh some of those have gone under now but there are yes yes lithography is alive lithography is alive and is still is still going on um, we're also getting comments in the chat about personal collections. Uh, Ellen Rubin, everyone's favorite pop-up lady, says she just acquired the lithographic stone for the cover of an 1898 Megendorfer movable book, part of her collection. Fabulous. Fabulous. Um, Envious. We do have, yeah. we have uh, three stones in the collection. We use them for teaching. I don't have any chromolithography. I don't have... Like how great would it be to have the whole library <laughs> of stones that were used for the Whittier's Boy? Uh, but we do have stones so that we can show them and teach them because, I mean, lithography is magic. If you've never seen it done, uh, go to YouTube. Immediately go to YouTube and start looking for um, people who are making lithography prints. It is um, uh, because you can't see it until you print it, until you ink it. You know, it's it's locked onto that stone. And then when you ink it, there it is. So it's uh, it's amazing. It's great. Um, we have a question and a compliment from Barbara H who says, what an amazing selection with a wonderful lecture. I'm always intrigued by paper ephemera and could not help seeing some parallels to textile history designs and techniques studied by quilt historians. Yeah, very, that's a good observation. There's a lot of crossover between paper and fabric. We, um, we hold a nice, I'd say it's a pretty strong collection of tech, printed textiles. 
Um, so right, not not quilting so much. That's that's out of our our scope. But we do we are very interested in the printers who in the 19th century were printing on fabric, like printed hankies for children, printed kerchiefs, um, things that would be framed. You know, uh, portraits of George Washington that were done in print, um, and printing on textile became a specialty in the 19th century because it's a slightly different to print on cloth than it is to print on paper. So those printers who started going that way, they would do a lot of theater work. They did Masonic aprons, um, that kind of printing. Yeah, we just, we got one that was printed on leather not that long ago, because I thought, ooh, there you go. I want to talk to that printer with a tarot set. Like how on earth did you get that leather to behave itself so that you could print on it like that? Um, I see Drew Oliver's asking a question about 19th century books that were once owned by us. So do they have our stamp in them, Drew? They say I bought them from George Goodspeed in the 1960s. I'd like to uh, know about. I'd like to know more about them. Yeah. Who, whom uh, shall I contact? So you would contact um, Elizabeth Pope. She is our curator of books. I'm not surprised. We had a very close relationship with George Goodspeed at that time. So. But this is Elizabeth Cope or Pope. Pope, like the Pope in Rome. Very good. Okay, will do. I will contact her. Very good. And we do get that question frequently because books do come in and out. So when there's duplicate books, sometimes they do get up, up, end up outside, but we always appreciate checking. These are beautiful books. <laughs> Great. Great. Uh, what questions have researchers come in to for this material about holidays, immigrants, or images of vases and cats and frogs? Um, all of the above. So the, the material comes out. I mean, I can't ever predict what the researcher is going to want. But, you know, I've had researchers come to me and say, do you have any image of squirrels? Well, do you have any images of squirrels? And I'll be like, yeah, we got a lot of squirrels on ephemera. I mean, yes, 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 yes. There's pigs. a lot. Right? And the pigs. Yeah, the pigs. We had a person coming doing pigs. So, uh, so yes. So the frogs, the cats, the pigs. So, you know, people come in with a theme that they're working on. Um, the, the labor story is another story that I would love a scholar or researcher to take up. Um, there are like uh, lists of prying employees. So we know how many people were in these factories. Harper's is another one that's not lithography, but just seeing the press rooms um, and how gosh darn many people there were who had to maintain these presses, uh, maintain the stones, move the stones around. They have rigging systems because the stones are uh, Bavarian limestone. So they're very, very heavy. Uh, so they would have rigging systems on the lowest level of the print shop that they could basically chain these things up and truck them to the press because they didn't have to lift them. So somebody had to maintain all of that, right? It's uh, the labor is really, I think a, a great story to be told there. And, and I see it every time. Now I can't unsee it. Every time I see a chromolithograph, I think, oh my gosh, that somebody had to take that through 15 steps without a dryer, you know, like how on earth did they make that happen? Um, a curly on about fringe that was unnoticed. Any special info about the use of fringe? The fringe comes into being right after the war, uh, episode 1865, 66. Uh, it really is quite popular in the 1880s. So like it's normalized by then. I think it was kind of a new thing early on. Um, I think it's, you know, my theory, I don't have any evidence for this, but my theory is, gosh darn it, can't we just have something pretty? You know, we've had, we've gone through a civil war. I want something that's pretty, that's soft, that's beautiful. And it, as, it, as I said in the, and you can see in the album, it's added value too. So it's kind of like, you know, in the 18th century, you could buy a book with illustrations or without. With illustrations, cost you more. In this case, the fringe is the added value that shows that you did the upcharge for your car, right? You, you paid the nice money for the card. It wasn't the little tiny one for the school children. This is the this is the pretty card. Yeah, the stones can easily weigh more than thirty pounds, Alan. I mean, honestly, you can't move them around, and they also be really careful because they will chip. Um, they break easily under pressure, so uh, we keep ours on the lowest possible shelf, and then usually we oop the truck right up to the shelf and then take it down onto the shelf and then keep it on the truck because they are they weigh so much, they're so dense. Again, labor, right? They have to move those things around. Uh, do I have any idea how long it would take for a print to dry? So here's, here's 
what I know about printing and the weather. Um, Louis Prang and the McLaughlin firm and most of the other big printers who are working at that before the dryer, this is before the dryers are invented, which is basically like, wasn't a conveyor belt, but it's moving things in a, a warm place where it can dry. Before that, they had drying houses where they would have a lot of airflow and hope, you know, that like with slots up, up on the top, they would hope that the, it would be a nice dry day. Um, but those of you who live on the East Coast, we haven't had a dry day in four days. So if you were running a print job right now, you would have to stop because nothing would dry. It's too humid. Um, the, the challenge of needing, you need the, the next, that, the, all the coats have to be hard before you can take the next one through. So it can take, in August, it might take a week to dry. In, you know, in December, it might take a day. So Prang and McLaughlin and some of the other Valentine's printers all print their Valentine's in December. They're, they're like, they're out selling their stuff because they're, they know there's no way they're going to print that after February because March is going to be wet. So they have to get, they try to get their orders out. They try to print them and they try to get them all printed so they can get to the shop and be sold because they know they won't dry because it's too wet to print. So yes, the weather definitely matters. And the paper matters, yes. The ambient humidity, yes. And the airflow. The airflow is key. And I feel like, you know, I've never seen a drying house in situ, but I can kind of imagine like, you know, where the windy place is, right? On your property, where the trees aren't blocking, where you have airflow, that's where you're gonna put your drying house. Uh, I think that's why actually Prang ends up in Roxbury because that's where his drying houses were when he had the business in Boston. He did keep the shop in Boston and his display rooms in Boston, but most everything moves out to Roxbury uh, when he gets up to sort of full industrial production. And the thickness of the paper, that's a great, a great point. Um, as I was sort of shuffling those cards, you could definitely, every time you touch them, you could feel like the thinner ones, right? And then the thicker ones. So there's definitely choices being made about paper thickness that probably are around price, I would guess. And, and then that cost, right? That poor salesman has to take that book out and sell stuff. If it's too expensive, he's not going to get any takers. So they have to keep the prices. The margins have to be reasonable. Uh, Litho, there were several employees. I've missed that one. Something about Providence. Oh, there's some, oh, they're saying there's good stuff in the Rhode Island Historical Society. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. There it is. There it is. Yeah, from uh, Providence Litho. We have some prints by Oh, I love the long time. Sorry, Sorry Lori. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was going to say there are a few questions. There are a couple of questions that kind of center on uh, the distribution of the cards. Like, were they mailed? Yeah. Are the stamps upside down on the postcards? Um, how did the fringe work in the mail? All of those things. So the fringe works in the mail because they're special envelopes. There's envelopes that are um, uh, puffier. You can, like, it's not as tight to slide your card in there. So your fringe won't get all smooshed. So there's envelopes for those. Um, uh, uh, cards go different, pla different places. They can go through the mail. They have envelopes and can go through the mail, but they're also, a lot of them are just hand, hand delivered to family members or, you know, whatever. Um, on the postcards, on the back, whoops, sorry, sorry, Nick. I'm going back to the camera. So two of the stamps are upside down and two of the stamps are right side up. And if I have a postal historian here, that'd be great because I have no idea why you would do that. <laughs> uh, but they are, good observation, sharp eyes out there, sharp eyes. Maddie and Charlotte are the two little girls. And then uh, one of them is their, uh, their cousin, they're coming cards from their cousin and their grandma. And LF, we don't know who LF is. This is these guys also introduce another characteristic, another quality that comes into the postcard business. These are all embossed, so the figures stand out, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of see it on here where the embossing is. That's that's another trip to the press that has to go through again. So to be continued there. But yes, they are upside down. And if they know why, please put that in the chat because I have no idea. <laughs> I 
So speaking of the cards, um, two things actually, which holiday cards seem to have been most popular based on the collection or collecting to date? Uh, our biggest collection is our Christmas and New Year's together. Like, so I would say the winter holiday card. I'm not, I'm leaving Valentine's out because that's a whole separate thing. Valentine's, uh, Worcester is uh, one of the centers for Valentine production in the U.S. So we have, you know, it skews our collection. We have a very, very large Valentine collection, um, which I would say is a skew. So, uh, but it was, there was some statistics. Um, I can't remember which paper did it. They were count, they were counting how many cards at Valentine's Day went through. Oh, that's cute. An upside down stamp used to mean giving a kiss. Oh, I hope that's true. I love that. <laughs> I love that. Um, the, the, um, oh, that's where we were. Where were we? I got distracted by the kiss. <laughs> Valentine's. Oh, Valentine's. Um, the, the Valentine's card. There were like, they went through, they looked at the New York post office and they counted circulation of Valentine postings on the 13th or the 11th. And it was like over a million cards were mailed in a single day. So there was a lot, and this was during the war. That's during the war. So there were Valentines going like to the soldiers and coming back. And I mean, yes, there was a lot of mail circulating, definitely. And the postcard, the rise of the postcard is uh, a good example of that because they want something that's cheaper. We go, so our ephemera goes to 1900. The postcard collection goes past that. The postcard collection is an interesting one. It, it's uh, formed, we've, we've maintained these cards even though they're from, you know, for us, we cut off at 1900. We have things from 1908 and 1910 here. But the card, the postcard collection itself, a lot are, are not all uh, pictorial cards like this. They're cards of like downtown Amherst, Massachusetts or downtown Philadelphia. And we keep them because they show the built environment of an earlier period. So the cards themselves, there's a lot of interest. We have a nice photo postcard collection. That's also later. But the postcards came to us as a collection from um, the Weirs were, were one of the groups of those collections that came to us. We also inherited a collection from a local institution that came to us. So those are all, you know, they're, they're a little bit later than our date, but we still, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to be biased and get rid of them or anything like that. There's allegedly a language of stamps, really? Like language of flowers? Okay, now that's fascinating. All right, we have to do more of these. <laughs> this is, this is, <laughs> let's get another topic, Eve. This is a good group. It's like having consultants. Um, oh, did birthday cards also become popular along with yes. Christmas and New Year's Eve? Yes. Yes, the birthday card um, is, is around the same time, is around the same date. So it's that post-war period. And we have many salesman sample books for uh, birthday cards, a lot of birthday cards. A lot, you know what? They're not quite as interesting as the holiday cards in some ways because the, I mean, they're mostly like flowers and this pretty scenes. And um, they're the kind of card that like today I would think it would be like a sympathy card. You know, it's a very sort of neutral image. Um, I really like, you know, the funny ones and the frogs and all that stuff. So, they, but they did become popular. Yes, they were sending cards out. Exactly. Um, the Walters Art Museum has a collection of progressive proofs. This is good. And which it's too. Yeah. You make a little map. <laughs> An exhibition. So the Boston Athenaeum did a show uh, where they pulled some of theirs out. And I remember thinking, oh, we got to collaborate and do. But then I'm like, who's going to go to that show? Other than all the people on this call, <laughs> you know, it's like, does any, is anyone going to care enough to go and look at, you know, 30 progressive proof books? I don't know. I don't know. Language of stamps. I'm going to have to look this up. That's very neat. I don't want to miss one quick question that was posed earlier about um, since you were so nice to show us the uh, housing from AAS for your scoop book, are those made by like conservation preservation staff at AAS or do you all? Uh, our boxes are a split. Yeah, yeah. So if it's a standard size, like if it's an Octavo or a folio standard size box, we will order boxes from a supply firm. That one was actually the one I showed was a custom box because the sales and sample books don't fit anybody's, you know, you can't order them out of the catalog. 
Uh, the Mylar pouches, we do have custom done uh, by a firm somewhere outside of DC. So there's, there's a, you know, a, those are made to our specs too, to fit in our boxes and to fit on our shelving. Yeah, space is of a premium here. We worry about space. Well, it is uh, six minutes after five Eastern time. Very good. So I think that now is about a great time as any to wrap things up. Um, I see Anne added a nice link in the chat about German uh, language of stamps. In the meantime, I want to express my thanks to Lauren, to Eve, and to AAS, and to everyone who made today's event possible. This has been super fun for me, and I hope for all of you too. Um, we invite you to check out all the upcoming events at AAS on their website, which is AmericanAntiquarian.org. And anytime you visit New York City, don't forget the Grolier Club is open with exciting bookish exhibitions. And we are at www.grolierclub.org. Thank you. Thank so much. you.